humans rely heavily on pollinator bees to sustain food production globally. But for decades, these insects have seen significant population decline. The problem is not new. But now there are groups working on innovative ways to tackle the issue of dying bees. William Brangham reports for our breakthrough series on the leading edge of science and technology. Get zen about it and don't freak out. Christy Allen's business is bees. They go out and they collect nectar. This small business owner manages 150 hives in and around you know, Minneapolis. She produces honey, she teaches beekeeping, and she even invented this pedal-powered honey extractor. I fell in love with the honeybee. They're just incredible. Um, they're a, a woman-run organization. <laughs> we have more of these cells, which is not a good sign. But here in Minnesota and around the world, there's a problem. Bees are dying off. Last year alone, beekeepers in the U.S. reported a 40% drop-off among their honeybees. Bees are struggling these days, and as a beekeeper, I see it through the, the eyes of a honeybee, and it, it being really difficult to keep them healthy and, and, and thriving. Here's some honey. Across the river at the University of Minnesota's Bee Lab, Dr. Marla Spivak, who studied bees for over 30 years, says this decline boils down to three things. The pesticides, the parasites, and the poor nutrition. Humans love to meddle and love to grow different things and like these plants here and these plants not here. And we want to spray this herbicide to keep these plants here and these plants not here. And, and so all of that affects what's available to bees to support their nutrition. Spivak, who received a 2010 MacArthur Fellowship for her work with bees, says the die-off started with the dramatic rise in the use of pesticides after World War II. The greatest potentiality of DDT lies in dispersal from planes. And it's a problem that continues to worsen today. Just this month, the Environmental Protection Agency approved the use of sulfoxiflor, a pesticide that's toxic to bees. There's something going on with the other queen that they don't like her. Christy Allen worries that the declining bee population is going to hurt more than just her business. Globally, three out of every four crops rely on bees for pollination. Our food will get way more expensive. Uh, the people who have money are going to be the ones that have access to things like really good fruits and vegetables that keep us healthy. So not only is it a, a huge public health concern, uh, there's huge economic ramifications. The Central Valley of California is where more than half the produce in America is grown. Every spring, more than 60% of the commercial bees in the country are put onto semi-trucks and carted thousands of miles out here. The hives are then placed at the edge of fields to help pollinate the flowering crops. It takes about two hives per acre. When bees move from flower to flower searching for nectar, pollen collects on the back of their legs. You can see the orange clumps on this guy. As they travel, they spread that pollen around, fertilizing the plants. But with bees in decline, as demand for them is rising, some see a business opportunity. These are carbon fiber blades, very sharp, very stiff. A company called Dropcopter is trying to create a technological fix for farmers who can't get enough bees. Yes. Co-founder Matt Cobal says his business partner had started looking into drones for food delivery, but then they had another idea. I'm out in the field with a friend of mine who grows almonds, and we're talking about bees and pollination. So one thing led to another, went down and visited the engineers that were making his device, and we switched it over to make it so it carries pollen. Their mechanical flying pollinator, still in its infancy, is simple in concept. Pollen is poured into a container attached to the bottom of the drone. Three, two, one. The drone is pre-programmed to follow an exact pathway above an orchard, shooting out the pollen in an even, regular spray as it flies. It'll just come, slide to the left, and head backwards up the hill. They demonstrated their drone for us over these fig trees, which don't actually need pollination. But this year, the company did real pollination on almond, apple, cherry, and pear orchards in California and New York. 
Chief Marketing Officer Mike Winch says they're not here to replace bees. We feel really strongly that it's a supplement to the bees. We can help provide a solution that doesn't provide further stress to the bee colonies, that enhances the food production capabilities for which they're responsible. I believe last year they're anywhere from 200 to 225 dollars a hive. 225 per hive. Per hive. Almond farmer Kevin Hebrew was one of Dropcopter's first clients. It's uniform. And what I, I like about it is you, it's hard to judge your bee activity. With the drone, you have a lot more opportunity. Three, two, one, go. Dr. Farrell Helbling is part of the team at Harvard University's Wies Institute, designing a miniature autonomous flying vehicle. They call theirs the RoboBee. But this is down at this scale, we kind of take inspiration from insects in trying to get this flapping motion that you can see. It's an amazing amount of engineering in something at that scale. It's incredible. And, you know, everything we do here, we have to come up with how we're going to build it, how we're going to manufacture it, how we're going to, you know, laser cut all of our materials. The goal is to create a small flying robot that mimics what a bee or a fly does. Helbling says if they can get the technology right, they could be used for anything from search and rescue to medicine to monitoring air quality, maybe even pollination. You can make many of them um, for not that much money. The material cost of these is actually very, very low. You can outfit these vehicles with like different sensors or different capabilities, and so you can have a swarm of them interacting with the environment. Of course, the idea of autonomous flying robots is the stuff of science fiction. We think one of your ADIs may be involved in an unexplained death. Sorry? A death? Ah. Uh -huh. In the Netflix series Black Mirror, tiny robot bees are corrupted for a more sinister use. Where are you doing that work? Is that over there with the killer bees in that room? <laughs> no. <laughs> no? No, 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 there's no killer bees here. We promise. All of those are so far into the future that, you know, it's really the challenge of like, how am I going to get everything that I need to get on board so that this bee isn't just a laboratory tool, but it can actually exist in the environment. So this is? Honey and wax. Back in Minnesota, Dr. Spivak is pretty skeptical of a technological fix for pollination. She says we need to focus more on protecting the real live bees that are still here. It's been 100 million years of evolution uh, to evolve all of these diverse bee species. And so creating one robot bee is going to miss out on all the other species that they could be pollinating. I would much prefer that we take that technology and use it to deliver pesticides in minute quantities where needed and only when needed. And for beekeepers like Christy Allen, there's also no replacement like for the real before. thing hear about, you know, different technologies. I understand there are benefits, but at what cost? I'm not a total Luddite, and I don't think we should just scrap all technology, um, but a drone versus a bee, it's a no-brainer decision for me. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm William Brangham.